All right, guys, it's time for a review of my favorite book of all time. Well, one of them. It's in my top five. And this is a book that I've read a few times, and just recently I have finished it for the third time. It is none other than Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. This is a book that is indescribable in many instances because there's really few things to describe it to compare it to like whether it be its genre it's a western but it's also what, what we call a neo-western or even an anti-western in some cases or its style or the themes that it is willing to tackle whether it be human existence the purpose of man to begin with philosophy and all that kind of stuff. This is a wide-ranging novel. But if there is one work I can compare it to, it's whether it's actually very on the nose because many people have described it as comparable to Moby Dick by Mer Herman Melville, which makes sense. Both novels deal with a main character who is essentially on an expedition with a bunch of different characters and which is ruled or, or is hovered over by a, a deme by a demeanor and a character who is haunting and compelling in many ways. With this, instead of Captain Ahab, it's, it's McCarthy's own Captain Ahab, who is one of the most horrific characters in literature, bar none, Judge Holden. This man is described as a giant who looks like a giant child. He has no hair on him anywhere. He has a paw, his head is like a big old egg. He's pale and he's horrifying. He knows all languages. He know he's he's a he's an astronomer. He's a geologist. He's an he's just everything. He puts things in his ledger. He writes about everything he can discover. And there is and when one person asks him why do you do that, his response is haunting. It is anything in creation that exists without my without my knowledge, exists without my consent. That is horrific, horrific and blood curdling. But he does more in the novel that would make you raise an eyebrow, a little bit more than just something like that. But as a synopsis, I'm sure people who are watching this are somewhat aware of it because Blood Meridian is a bit of an acquired taste for people because it's very plotless. Like the main plot, if you can give it that, is that the kid who is a an illiterate, a literate runaway orphan. Well, he's not an orphan. He just leaves his father. Is from Tennessee, and he joins the the Glanton gang, who were an actual group of scalp hunters in the old west in the 1850s. And what they're doing is they're going to wipe out the um, the Apaches, which are these Indian tribes. They're going through all of west, even into Mexico, to wipe them out and to scalp them. It's an expedition. And even though Glanton is a, is the head of the of the actual group, Judge Holden is the one who's really is who actually holds the strings in many cases, because without him, under many circumstances in the novel, without him, they probably the the, Grant, the the gang probably would have been killed by many other people if it wasn't for the judge, knowing his way of languages and how he can adapt to any person. He can calm things down if it's necessary. It's uncanny. The kid, the character of the kid is a little hard to kind of grasp sometimes because you can't tell if he has any sort of understanding or moral compass that is in some way di divergent from the group itself. But there are a few instances that can kind of lead that he is a little better than them. Like when one of the, one of the comrades of their little group it has been shot with an arrow through his leg and he's like I need someone to help me but none of them will do it but the kid will do it and he ends up doing it and the priest Tobin actually tells him he's like why would you do that you know if it happened to you he would just kill you so it kind of goes into this little theological perspective because McCarthy was a Catholic he was raised Catholic but if you read interviews he would describe that he didn't really understand it like he didn't he didn't notice any discussion about religion or God when he was in there that's his sort of subtle jab at the Catholic Church. But while I said that this is an all-encompassing novel, it really is. Like Moby Dick, which I describe more as a universalist novel because it tackles almost everything. It tackles etymologies, it tackles histories 
of the whales. Like I'm talking about like Moby Dick, how it tackles it. It tackles through mythology lenses, through religious lenses, through philosophy, through like geographics. It's just all ranging. And that is what this does in many cases because the judge, there's an instance in the novel that's one of the best, like one of the most best semic scenes in a novel ever. The gang, uh, Tobin is, re is retelling to the kid that the gang at one point they were out of ammo, but the Apaches were on their tail. But the, they find the judge on this mound. He's all naked, and he's like, come up here. And what he does is, knowing that he's a knower of many things that they're not aware of, he essentially, through the help of pissing on lava rocks and all this stuff, they make gunpowder. And the way they do it, they make it in such a way that it explodes in such a way that they've never seen before, and they end up killing the Apaches once they get to them. This is a scene that alludes to Paradise Lost because the two works that it re references more than any other are, if it's not the Bible or Moby Dick, it's Melville's Paradise, I mean, Milton's Paradise Lost because the judge is somewhat reminiscent of Satan in that novel because Satan in the novel of, of um, Paradise Lost is someone whose desire to overthrow is never quenched. He wants to constantly continue on with his existence. Whereas with the judge, that's what his philosophy is also. Which one, which one thing I want to do in this review that I haven't done in my other reviews is kind of go over a few passages that I think are very crucial to kind of pinpoint the meaning of the novel. Because a lot of people I've seen who have reviewed this and it's not just people on YouTube, it's other reviewers that I that are well known, like even Stephen King. Stephen King claims this to be one of his favorite novels of all time, and yet he even says, like, there are pa passages of it. He wrote this in his book on writing. He'll be like, there are passages in this that I just don't get. I'm like, I kind of want to alleviate that because there is a por point to the novel that I think people can discover if they read really closely to what the judge is doing. Here's a passage that the judge says to his group. Because this is the one of the things that he constantly does every now and then. He'll usually give a lecture and, and kind of perusal through his group, through the gang, about mysteries of human existence, about problems with our, about struggling and war and all that kind of stuff. And this is a part that I think is very crucial to understand, to understand the point of the novel. Judge Holden says... Moral law is an invention of mankind for the disenfranchisement of the powerful in favor of the weak. Historical law subverts it at every turn. A moral view can never be proven right or wrong by any ultimate test. A man falling down dead in a duel is not thought thereby to be proven in error as to his views. His very involvement in such a trial gives evidence of a new and broader view. The willingness of the principles to forego further argument as the triviality which it in fact is and to petition directly the chambers of the historical absolute clearly indicates of how little moment are the opinions and of what great moment the divergences thereof. For the argument is indeed trivial, but not so the separate wills thereby made manifest. Man's vanity may well approach the infinite incapacity but his knowledge remains imperfect. And however much he comes to value his judgments, ultimately he must submit them before a higher court. What this passage is saying essentially is, think about it like, think about a duel. Two people duel to the death, they're fighting. What usually is the catalyst for something like this? It's a disagreement. It's a disagreement in beliefs, or it can be a disagreement in their beliefs or in a disagreement in arguments. It could be a disagreement of almost anything. But what he says right here, a man falling dead in a duel is not thought thereby to be proven in error. What he says there, if you're in a duel, if one dies and the other lives, that doesn't thereby prove that the guy who died was in error in his views. That's not how that would work. And just because you won the duel doesn't mean that your view was right also in any ultimate sense. But what, but what is really damning here and what flips it, and this is where I really love this passage, is when he says this. The willingness of the principles, a.k.a. the people in the duel, the willingness of the principles to forgo further argument as the triviality which it is in fact, which it in fact is, 
and to petition directly the chambers of the historical absolute clearly indicates of how little moment are the opinions of the opinions. What this is saying is the fact that people are willing to kill over differences of opinion in a way kind of makes your arguments void. It makes your beliefs in that, pos in that position void because how could it not? I mean, you're willing to die for a belief, but how are you able to prove it in any sense? The dying doesn't prove it true or false, so how can you prove it? In a, in, a, in a way that doesn't revolve to violence. This is a damning perusal on human nature and how we are in, inevitable to f conflict with each other. We're always having to conflict with each other because of differences of opinions or arguments, beliefs, or even, or even like presuppositions, how we set up a metaphysics, which is what you need to do based on epistemology. And he even says that right here. In which he says, um, where was it? Hold on one second. Man's vanity may well approach the infinite in capacity, but his knowledge, which is epistemology, remains imperfect because we cannot know all things. That, in a way, works against us when we want to have an argument because how else are you going to learn truth if you're willing to die in a certain moment in which if you don't do that, you could live longer and you could try to find new perspectives and kind of broaden your perusal. I mean, not your perusal. You can broaden your worldview, your knowledge. You can broaden it. And with that, you can broaden your metaphysics, your beliefs, how you view the world, what you can determine is real. And also the part where he says right here, moral law is an invention of mankind for the disenfranchisement of the powerful in favor of the weak. This right here is McCarthy. He is being directly Nietzschean. This is a this is a direct reference to Nietzsche. If you read his works Beyond Good and Evil and on the Genealogy of Morals, that's what he's referring to. Because on the Genealogy of Morals, Nietzsche just he describes, he builds up a foundation of the Slaven morale, which is the slave and master morality. And the way he does that is by looking into history. And that's what the judge is saying here when he says the law and how it, it's historical and how it subverts it at every turn. Because when the Roman Empire, just as an example, the kings, the or, the, or not just the kings, but also not the king, but the Caesar, the people in power, the masters who own the slaves, they are viewed as good. Whereas the slaves or the lowly people or the poor, they're bad. That's how they set up a moral dilemma back then. And that is what he's talking about when he says it's an invention of mankind for the disenfranchisement. That's directly relating, alluding to Nietzsche on the genealogy of morals. And because man has to invent morality, this is where Nietzsche kind of comes in with on Beyond Good and Evil, in which he further expounds his descriptions and on his, in a philosophical treaty, that Beyond Good and Evil is where he essentially expounds his beliefs of the Ubermensch. Which is the overman, and what he and what this is, and here's where the problem comes in. I know this; I'm going a little off topic, but it, it's crucial to understand this. The Ubermensch, when when people try to normally attack it, they used they always want to say U Nietzsche was like, "Oh, morals are irrelevant. You can just get rid of it. And you can do whatever you want." That's like the tradition. That's not well. It's not traditional. That's more like the Christian like straw manning of his nonsense because he was an atheist. But no, what he is saying is. Morality, the herd morality, and what the herd morality is, it's the morality that, I mean, even today, like you can find the herd morality on the right or the left. It's the morality that everyone just kind of accepts, and they don't really try to think too deeply about their morals. They don't try to understand the origins of them, how you can argue for them. That's the, the herd. You just accept it at face value, and you don't really critically think it. But the Ubermensch, he is the one who is willing to to look past past the prejudices of the past philosophers, which is an at, which is a chapter in the book Beyond Good and Evil, in which he argues Nietzsche argues that the reason that we have heard moralities and we have really strange like we can't understand we have our misconceptions about morals is because of past philosophers' prejudices. And he doesn't mean prejudices like they were mad. It was mean like they just weren't capable enough to interpret it. And once people build off on misinterpretations, you just lead to chaos. And so the Ubermensch is the man who finds the problems in the past moralities and he transcends them. 
That's what it means. That's what the phrase beyond good and evil means. It means being beyond the good and evil morality that the herd is telling you, that you become, you set up your own morality. That goes to what the judge is saying here when he says that a moral view can never be proven right or wrong by any ultimate test and that men will make up their moralities. And here's the other point. This is where the point of the novel, for me, actually comes in full circle in which you're able to understand what the point of the novel is. This is at the very end when the judge is con is confronting the kid who is who is now the man because a, ch a change has come to him at the very final pages. And this is essentially the climax of the novel. The judge is at a bar with the kid and he's telling the kid, pick a man, any man, that man there, see him, that man hatless. You know his opinion of the world. You can read it in his face, in his stance. Yet his complaint that a man's life is no bargain masks the actual case with him, which is that men will not do as he wishes them to, have never done, never will do. That's the way of things with him and his life is so balked about by difficulty and because altered and become and become so altered of its intended architecture that he is little more than a walking hovel hardly fit to house the human spirit at all can he say such a man that there is no malign thing set against him that there is no power and no force and no cause what manner of heretic could doubt agency and claim it alike what the judge is describing here is what is inherent in all humans. It's inherent in everything. What he is saying here is that the reason we as humans have conflicts, why we have struggles, why we suffer, why we cannot let, a, let well, well alone with other people, this is, he's describing in many cases, why we have differences of opinion in politics and religion and why we are, we're, we are willing to sacrifice our humanity to people. We are willing to scapegoat and to slander and to hate and to our own family and friends. Why? Because in every human, men will not do, we are upset at the, at the heart of ourselves because men will not do as we wish them to. And that is what he says, that men will not do as he wishes them to. That is why we have conflict. That is the purpose of Blood Meridian, and that is the purpose of the judge. That is why he exists. Let me explain a little further, because there's another passage that I haven't yet read, but it connects to that passage. This passage I just read about the man seeing him, that the fact that life is no bargain isn't the case. The case is that when you do exist, the people that you interact with, they won't believe what you believe. They don't, they don't believe what you believe. They don't accept what you want them to accept. That is why we have politics. That is why we have confrontations. That is why we anger with each other, because we want them to see like us. And if they don't, we're gonna, we would be willing to do anything. And that connects to the passage I said about the principles willing to forgo further argument. Because at certain points, when you kill somebody over an anger dispute, whether it be an argument or something like that, that is when you give up on that. But this is where it fully connects and comes full circle. This is the most famous passage from Judge Holden, I would probably say. I think it's his most famous and people like to quote to a lot. And this is what he means. This is the nature of war, whose stake is at once the game and the authority and the justification. Seen so, war is the truest form of divination. It is the testing of one's will and the will of another within that larger will, which which because it binds them together, I mean, which binds them is therefore forced to select. War is the ultimate game because war is at last a forcing of the unity of existence. War is God. That is the point of Blood Meridian. That is the point of Judge Holden, why he is so chaotic and why he is considered war incarnate by people like Harold Bloom. What he is describing here is that without, even from the, because morality is not inherent, 
But the thing that is inherent in all things is the urge of conflict. It is why the man is upset that he that people won't believe what he wants them to believe. But but this is where it becomes a bit of a paradox, even more of a paradox. You cannot have existence without conflict, without friction. You can't have atoms. You can't have the basic necessities of physics, of biology, without a friction, without a yin and a yang, without a negative and a positive. Without human conflict, there's no progress. You can't evolve. There's no evolving in beliefs or even in systems without challenging. That is the point of Blood Meridian. War is indeed God because when he says war, it doesn't just necessarily mean like actual like going to war. It means conflict because that's another, that's a synonym. That's a, it's a synecdoche of that. I love Blood and Radian, guys. This is a beautiful novel. Even it's even though it's bleak in scope, and even though it can be depressing and it can be long at points, there are many. It's very beautifully written. It is one of the most beautifully written novels ever. McCarthy's the the way he is able to describe beautiful like panoramas of vistas of the of nature of the he can build an atmosphere. It is beautiful. But the fact that he contrasts the beautiful nature to the horrific goings on of the scalpings and the murdering is just makes it all the more ironic. And it's such a great novel. I, I want you guys should all read this. Let me know what you think about Blood Meridian. Do you think that's the point of the novel? Do you think there's something deeper that I'm maybe not um, thinking about at the moment? Because there probably is. That's the thing about literature. That's the thing about great literature is that the great novels are the novels that you can reread over and over again and discover things and meanings and even subtleties that you didn't catch before. And it just makes it all the more beautiful and even more complicated. Next book I'll probably be doing a review of is As I Lay Dying because I'm getting through that. I think I mentioned in my last video that I want to read all of Faulkner's works before the year is over and I'm still sticking to that one. Unlike the one I did last year when I said I would read those books. I know I'm sorry for it. But um, I would also recommend if you like my analysis of the book to like and subscribe. And let me know what you think. I really appreciate all of you guys. You guys are giving me uh, some. You guys help me being a voice in this uh, political. I mean not political sphere. But the YouTube sphere. Because I like to. I want to kind of get my audience a little bigger. But I guess it's all up to you guys if you're into this. So thank you so much. And I hope you all have a very great day.